it is truly my honor and pleasure to greet you all here uh, at the Hoover Institution. My name is Alice Hill, and this is my first event that I have participated in with the Hoover Institution, so I'm thrilled to be doing that. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel to discuss uh, national security and climate change today, uh, as well as you'll get a chance to see the Age of Consequences documentary that takes a look, a close look, at the threats and risks posed by climate change to our security framework. So I want to make sure, I'm going to keep the introductions brief so that we can get right to the talk. Uh, but at the far end, we have uh, Deke Slayton, who has been with uh, Hoover, I think, for four years or? Since 2010. Oh. Since 2010. All right. The time does fly. It does. Uh, and uh, is a former, former uh, uh, formerly from the Navy and works on the Arctic. We have Gary Ruffhead, uh, who is here in the Washington office, uh, former Admiral of the Navy and uh, also significantly was spearheading Navy Task Force Climate Change. Thank yes, you. I would agree. Thank you. Uh, Thank and you. that work was particularly significant to me. Uh, I did work at DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, on climate change and national security, and the Navy's work was pivotal. And then we have Andrew Revkin, who has been uh, fighting the good fight on bringing attention to climate change for many, many years uh, at uh, the New York Times and most recently at ProPublica. ProPublica. Pro yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here. I'll take Thanks. my seat. Thank you very, very much, Alice. Thanks for uh, inviting me to help engage everybody here. We're going to talk for probably about a half hour amongst ourselves and then open up for questions. Uh, just for a little context, this is my, um, well, next year will be my 30th year writing about this thing called global warming. Back then, it was the greenhouse effect. Then uh, there was the Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the IPCC, climate change. And then global warming became the term. And then climate change is the term again. I don't have to take much. I don't put much weight into these rhetorical questions. But there is there, one thing I want to get to pretty quickly is uh, defining terms, because there has been some pushback on the idea of making climate change um, on a par with other issues that um, are being considered as in the context of national security. So I think we'll talk maybe a little, about, a little bit about that first. Um, the climate is changing. The um, greenhouse gases function, or we wouldn't be here. The planet wouldn't be habitable. Uh, the good news is that we just found a, the, uh, NASA just found seven Earth-sized planets orbiting a sun only 40 light years away. So if we screw things up really badly, uh, if we sustain our capacity to get into space, um, maybe we'll have some other options. But 40 light years is a long way. Um, I've been uh, to the Arctic four times when I was lucky enough to get to the North Pole 2003 with scientists camped on the sea ice. I've been to the middle of the Indian Ocean. I've been to the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Um, and in most of these places, the, the things that are changing are pretty remarkable. The, I think we'll talk for sure about the Arctic, because uh, I remember I wrote a piece for Dot Earth, my blog at the New York Times, maybe six years ago. And the title was something like, Arctic shipping becomes boring. In other words, it was no longer news <laughs> that ships were going through, um, was well, certainly not along the Russian coast, but uh, increasingly now there was a cruise ship just last year. Big, full-size cruise ship went through the Northwest Passage. Lots of reports over the years about the US having inadequate icebreaker capacity. And you, we could talk about why icebreakers still matter, even in a, a warming world with yeah. less ice than the Arctic Ocean. Um, but first, let's get back to this issue of, I just want a definition of terms. Um, and some of the pushback has been from another H group, Heritage, <laughs> had, had um, pushed back about, against Obama in some ways in, in talking about part of the critique from uh, Dakota, Dakota Wood there a year or two ago was about national security. And then there's the issue of climate change. And that, I, have, I have my own questions about climate change because uh, there's also climate vulnerability, meaning there are parts of the world where the climate can do terrible things and it will, science doesn't really clarify, even going forward, how much of that will be from greenhouse gases changing the climate versus just us getting in harm's way. So Alice, could you talk a little bit from your perspective at NSC you know, about how you gauge, how you define those terms? 
Well, national security, I think, uh, when you're working on the NSC, has a, a narrow definition of state-to-state -state conflict. Uh, and so you'll see that we're divided in regional bureaus uh, looking at uh, different countries. Uh, but then uh, national security also encompasses uh, cross-cutting risks, like cybersecurity, where you have a functional team looking at what happens. Climate change is like that, it cuts across. Climate will touch virtually, does touch virtually everything, and the risks appear in many places uh, and in many manifestations. One of the challenges I found in dealing with national security and climate change is that many of the experts on national security haven't received much education as to what climate change is and what it will look like going forward. So uh, as most of us do our work, we are more comfortable where we are already experts. Uh, and uh, sometimes there is a lack of appreciation for what these risks could mean, because simply they haven't had the exposure or the time to really study the risks. So if you define national security as economic prosperity, the health of your people, the ability to secure the way of life that we have in the United States, climate change will touch virtually all of those. Then you have more traditional national security threats, uh, migration at your borders, your ability to respond to military conflict, humanitarian mission of the uh, Department of Defense. So, uh, and they're actually their readiness as well to uh, perform their missions. So uh, as we have a broader definition of national security, there's a greater appreciation of what these risks are to us from climate change. Ed, could you talk a little bit about your experience, what, what was described earlier with the Navy, dealing with this issue? Yeah. How did that play out? Um, how did it start? Um, well, I, I've long had an interest in, in what's happening to the planet. And, uh, you know, I think it began in my formative years, and I don't even think Alice knows this, but I spent my formative years in, in what is reputed to be the hottest inhabited city in the world, uh, in southern Iran, and then also in the Sahara Desert. Um, a far cry from the ocean. Um, maybe that's why I was drawn to the Navy. But um, <laughs> the, um, as, as I uh, kind of looked around the world, in my view, um, you really have to be in denial to not realize that the planet is changing. Uh, and it's changed within my career that I've seen the effects of climate change and particularly, I started to look at the issue of sea level uh, rise and, and the compression of populations uh, toward the coasts and the creation of megacities. And, and in my view, as you look at this changing planet and the environment of the planet and how it affects food and water um, and, and prosperity, uh, and then you overlay what the demographic changes are. In my view, that was the best predictor of where we as a Navy would likely be called upon to either deal with friction and confrontation and conflict, or where we would have to be able to respond to a humanitarian uh, uh, disaster. And so that was the whole idea of, of pulling this together. And in a more parochial sense, um, the Navy owns a lot of waterfront property, mm -hmm. and, and that waterfront property sure uh, is really expensive. And so if, if you believe that the water levels are going to be rising, which I do, um, you have to be thinking about what your investments will be for that infrastructure. And so that was the genesis of Task Force Climate Change, and oh, by the way, one of the offshoots was what we called the Arctic Roadmap, because as you mentioned, there's a whole new ocean that's opening up, and that hasn't happened in millennia. And so what does that mean uh, for a Navy? And you know, you can get excited when there's a new ocean if you're in the Navy. It doesn't happen very <laughs> often. So, um, but, but it also means that, that uh, and I think we'll probably get into this, as, um, as that ocean opens, it doesn't mean that it's going to be benign and easy to operate in. And so what are the investments that you have to make? And of course, the, the poster child for that is the icebreaker. But any of the other ships 
You have to think about ice hardening because you'll be moving mm -hmm. through pack ice. You have to think about uh, the systems within the ship that are able to maintain the environments that you need. You have to think about the configurations topside so that you don't get ice formation and then the stability of that ship becomes problematic. And the whole idea behind Task Force Climate Change was to cause the Navy to start thinking about where are we going, what are the factors that we're going to have to deal with. And so that was the push. And, and you would expect uh, that there were some people around who thought that we were greening the Navy. But in point of fact, if you talk about all of the things that I mentioned, you're talking about how can we make the Navy more operationally effective in a changing planet. And that's what the thrust was. So I apologize for the long answer. No, that was, that was fine. So speaking of the Arctic, David, you've thought a lot about this too. Um, can you get a little bit more into the strategic implications as they're understood so far? Lawson Brigham, who used to be an icebreaker captain, yes. has, he wrote a piece I cited a few years ago where he said the Arctic is unusual, though, because it has so much. We already have the Arctic Council. We have right. diplomatic instruments and relationships, at least some are not problematic, but some are, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. And uh, Lost in Brigham is part of our Arctic team, Arctic Security Initiative here at Hoover. And uh, with regard to you, you had mentioned you spent some time up in the Arctic. I've spent about three years of my life uh, up in the Arctic when I was a little bit younger than I am right now. And last year on New Year's Eve, uh, I was 240 miles north of the Arctic Circle on December 31st, and it was 36 degrees. Fahrenheit. So Gary mentioned the changes that have happened uh, both over the long term and, and the short term. And I'm here to tell you, having spent a significant amount of time in that region over the past 30, 35 years, and then going back last year and seeing the dramatic changes, not only in the temperature, but really in the, in the geography of the area with the lack of ice uh, that's there right now is, is fairly significant. And when we started when we started the Arctic Security Initiative at Hoover back in 2012, people were kind of scratching their heads. You know, Gary and I, you know, had put our heads together for a while on on this on the things that go into it. You know, Andy, that you had mentioned the strategic, you know, geostrategic and geopolitical implications. So you know, the question was asked: Is why is this group of people in California, <laughs> at Stanford University, <laughs> starting a Arctic working group? And not more than a few months later, the Russians rolled into Crimea which brought to, the, brought to the surface a number of the other ways that, that Russia was, was directly <laughs> under, undermining the vital interests of the United States. But it also brought into the brought in very sharp focus the changes that were happening uh, in the Arctic. And what I'd like to say is the reason why we like to focus on, on that region, particularly when we talk about the changing climate and the changing oceans, is things happen there first and they happen there faster. So what we see, what we can observe, what we can directly measure in the Arctic right now has direct applicability to the rest of the planet. And just for one kind of visual for you to take away, if all the ice on Greenland melted, sea level rise would go up 24 feet. Now, do I think that's going to happen in, in my lifetime or even in my children's lifetime? No. Is there a distinct? possibility or even a high probability that maybe 10% of that ice will melt, which would lead to a 2.4 foot sea level rise? Absolutely. Do I think that can happen in my lifetime? Absolutely. And as Gary mentioned, and as, have we, as we've seen, just even these slight increases in sea level rise around the world cause, particularly when they're coupled with other weather phenomena, can have absolutely devastating effects. You know, when we get to you know, the points that, that Alice brought up about, about security, you know, we kind of group these things into two areas, you know, cultural security items, you know, those things that under, underpin, you know, a nation's commerce, economy, uh, the well-being of the population, those items. And then we get into the hard, you know, security items, you know, the protection of borders, uh, items associated with, with sovereignty, uh, deterring and addressing aggression. Well, now we have, we see, in opening Arctic, we see the two historical guarantors of security in the Arctic, the United States and, the, and Russia, now coming into direct competition over resources that were not available, over an ocean that was uh, unnavigable, 
and now coupled with the with the things we've seen over the past four or five years from Russia, makes for a pretty interesting geostrategic and uh, and geopolitical situation going forward. So that's what at Stanford and at the Hoover Institution with regard to the Arctic uh, and how it how it directly applies to the changing climate and the dynamics that we're seeing in the oceans worldwide. Uh, that's why we do what we do. And uh, needless to say, it's been a fairly dynamic and very rich uh, area of research and, and policy measure recommendations. Alice, I wanted to ask you, you've brought up this, um, this traditional structure of the National Security Council being mainly state to state. Um, you mentioned there are other cross-cutting things. Those seem way harder. Um, two years ago, uh, yeah, it's actually two years ago, 2015, the European Science Foundation came out with this big report on on mega hazards, geo, geo hazards that we mostly don't think about because they're too big. Um, the next Tambora volcano. In, 19, in 1815, giant eruption uh, that that was the year without summer. It actually led to the, that's when the, the, the story of Frankenstein came out because the world's climate was so turbulent and dark that at Lake Geneva, um, Mary Shelley and these other writers were hunkered down and they wrote horror stories. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but that's the least of it. It was famines and all kinds of things from this volcano. And if that erupted today, the calculations for the impacts of it on the climate, uh, on agriculture, uh, on aviation, aviation, forget about it. You know, think about that small Icelandic one. Um, and what the report called for is, it, it says there, there's this big gap, not just national capacity, but international capacity to talk about um, coordinating responses to things like that. It's like a fast motion version of what we're talking about with global warming mm -hmm. uh, and not related to human activity. But th there seems to be a gap in how the world is dealing with things like this. And you know, the Paris Agreement doesn't even touch those aspects of these problems. Uh, so I don't know if that's relevant. Is there a way to jog not just the national security apparatus within the United States, but internationally for us to have more coordination on the resilience adaptation side of these things? Well, I uh, just returned, uh, thanks to uh, a guest of Senator uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, from the Munich Security Conference, which is ranked as the top national security conference uh, in the globe, uh, the best think tank conference. Uh, and there were over uh, 70 countries represented and 500 uh, official attendees. A couple of remarkable things from that for me was that climate did not play heavily. Uh, there was a uh, panel discussion that was important uh, about the risks, but we still, that group still reflects what we see here in the United States, is an underappreciation of how significant and incredibly urgent uh, it is for nations to be prepared. But Often uh, we see and work in the government that the immediate uh, crowds out the urgent and the urgent uh, crowds out the important. Uh, climate change fits in all those categories, but we have difficulty in uh, having sustained engagement. That was certainly reflected to me as I observed the, what was happening there. So yes, we need a governance structure, but probably folks would tell you we need a governance structure for cybersecurity, for bioterrorism, exactly. yeah. uh, for other major threats that there are, uh, risks that there are in the world. Is it governance or is it something different, just communication capacity? Um, mm. Governance implies that old UN model that a lot of people would resist, which is some big machine that tells us all what to do. Well, with climate, I think there's remarkably good sharing of mm -hmm. scientific information, truthfully. I think that uh, we work well with uh, the other uh, meteorological offices around yeah. the world in sharing information. So it's more a question of how will we collectively address this. And of course, Paris was a great example of an attempt to mm -hmm. get that to that on the carbon side. But we certainly will see impacts across the globe equal in impacts and vulnerable populations will be greatly suffering. Some of those populations, uh, if they have sufficient m means, will be on the move. And those migrations, our own National Intelligence Council has told us that we could, in all uh, probability, see unprecedented movement within 20 years mm -hmm. of populations. 
Um, yeah, they also said something quite remarkable. This is a report issued by our National Intelligence Council last fall. Uh, they're the think tank, essentially, for our intelligence. Uh, and they said that lack of preparedness for these right. risks probably could be the greatest disruptor of all, that we simply aren't getting ourselves ready. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk to the two people with military experience, because you also happen to probably be in a cultural environment that's pretty diverse, more diverse than, let's say, the environment of people who would go to the Paris climate negotiations. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're in a moment in our history where uh, finding ways to cross cultural political barriers is going to be essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, it's felt for a long time like splitting off the, the resilience issue from the greenhouse gas mitigation issue is one way to do that. In other words, climate vulnerability is a very different thing than climate change. And uh, when you bundle them together, that creates a target for people who don't want to deal with the emissions. But the vulnerability is there going forward in spades. So could you just yeah. talk a little bit about having, I'm sure you must yeah. have dealt with this in some way or other. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and the thing that has struck me is that we've allowed the, the debate, um, rather strident debate, of, about climate change to really squelch out what I think is the important discussion that we have to have, and mm -hmm. that is, what are we, you know, what are we going to do about it? And Absolutely. and there are two uh, two things that uh, that I think about a lot, and uh, you know we we think about sea level rise and 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 problems in some of the more arid areas of the planet that are causing these migrations, but. But I believe that we are setting up in Asia for a collision between two things. Um, one is the fact that the ice cap that is the water supply for the great rivers of Asia is diminishing. And then you overlay the, the hydroengineering that's taking place as each country tries to protect and preserve that resource for itself, choking off sources uh, down downstream, and then in Asia in particular, you have a massive, rapidly rising middle class. And what does that middle class want? It wants <coughs> air conditioning. It wants these fancy projectors, yeah. uh, uh, refrigeration, and all of that will demand water, either for power generation, cooling, okay. or hydropower that will beginning that will become choked off. And so I think that Asia in the next twenty to thirty years is going to confront a huge, huge problem. So that to me is is one of the significant issues. And the other thing that I'm really concerned about is um, the role of science in in how we approach uh, these discussions and levels of cooperation going forward. And uh, you know, I think you can, you can always debate science, but I'm hopeful that we're not entering a period where we don't do the science. And, 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 and I think in our country, um, you know, as a kid that grew up with National Geographics and you know, <laughs> right. all the, this, this era of exploration, Space and understanding science, and, and, and causing people to think, you know, deeply. I mean, that was, you know, in, in that day for me, that was when we made the deepest dive into the Marianas Trench. You know, did that cause me to get out of the desert and go in the Navy? Maybe it did, I don't know. <laughs> but but that, that approach and the emphasis on science and a collective view on how do we uh, look at the science and then we can debate it. But uh, I'm, I'm fearful that we may be um, short shrifting that aspect of it, and and I think that would be extraordinarily short-sighted and extraordinarily harmful. Well, I, I did, yeah. yeah, I did an interview with uh, Will Happer, the Princeton physicist, who is one of the people who has been interviewed by Donald Trump as a possible science advisor. I did that a week ago, Monday. He most of the coverage of him has focused on his um, completely off the charts rejection of the idea that CO2 is a risk. He he loves CO2 carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas that's driving climate change. 
But he, on everything else he said uh, in my interview with him, which got beyond some of the caricatures in the media that focus on the client, that thing, was about sustaining and building the capacity to observe and understand environmental change, right. um, sustaining the capacity to innovate, mm -hmm. um, science education. And I saw some prospect there for um, progress. I, I don't know if you have your own sense, maybe we'll, we'll go to David too, on yeah. how to make this case uh, to distinguish what might be polarizing aspects of this from the fundamental merits of science. I wanna, I wanna not only build on that, but build on a point you made earlier about mm -hmm. how the, you know, the discussion on greenhouse gas emissions and the, and the vulnerabilities that climate change brings and are conflated and kind of separate those. And I think we found uh, that starting a discussion on the issue that's, that's anchored either on economics or on security normally gets one further into a constructive conversation. So on the, on the uh, security side, obviously, when we talk about the inundation of critical infrastructure, not only that that's important to our nation's defense, obviously we have critical infrastructure here in the United States on both the East and the West Coast, but worldwide, all of it at risk uh, to, to inundation. And you know, to that point, in like in Virginia and the Bay Capes, you know, around our around our bases in in, uh, in Norfolk, you know, we can build a 12-foot wall around the base and pretty much adequately secure the base. But if we don't do the same for the communities that support that base, you know, where our sailors and Marines live outside the base then that does no good. I mean, it, it's going to require a broader, more holistic approach uh, than just protecting the infrastructure. It's everything that goes along with you know, what that infrastructure supports, who maintains that infrastructure, how to get in and, and, and basically continue on along the lines. The other side, and to kind of build on a point that was brought up earlier, is the economics. You know, if we go back and we look at the economic price crisis in 2007, that was largely anchored around residential real estate. And now if you look at the commercial real estate portfolio here in the United States, and, and indeed globally, you're talking magnitudes of order above what the impact's going to be. And we're already starting to see that. So I think this debate is going gonna, is gonna to move out of an environmental discussion and move very quickly into an economic discussion. Because when you no, no longer have insurance companies or underwriters that are willing to go in and support these major infrastructure projects in coastal areas, when you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the economic engines to support municipalities, states, and sovereign governments. So we're starting to see these very direct impacts economically, which again is going to be a convening uh, topic on, this, on the broader topic of the impacts of climate change around the planet. So you had a no, thought, just to we're going to go to the uh, audience. You know, we, we talked about some of the security issues, but you get into the economic realm. And uh, if you go down to the coast on the Gulf of Mexico, uh, what is that shoreline? It is massive petrochemical facilities. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about sea level rise there. What's the impact uh, on, on, on that enterprise? You travel from here to Boston, uh, and you go th over a series of bridges and under a, a series of tunnels that entire uh, infrastructure is at risk. And those are the discussions that, you know, quite frankly, uh, I think we need to be having. Mm -hmm. is how do you deal with that? Because I'm not sure, you know, putting uh, uh, dikes up around all of those facilities is yeah. the answer. And, and, and yes, we're a couple of decades out, but those are massive investments, uh, massive technological challenges. And, and, and I really do believe we, we have to have those discussions and we really need to start them now. So and, and there just was, to yes, add yeah. uh, on the infrastructure point, uh, you know, we don't add that much infrastructure every year, uh, but it's pretty clear that the infrastructure we're adding right now, so something that should be in service for 50 to 100 years, is not climate resilient. So we're making investments right now in wastewater treatment plants, bridges, whatever, not looking at how level this, what the level of the sea will be, how much flooding there will be. Uh, and if we don't have that discussion on infrastructure, to Gary's point, right now, those investments are essentially at risk of either being washed away or just not operating as intended. And just 
th there is an opportunity for bipartisan agreement on this because it actually happened. The Bigert Waters bill, 2010-ish uh, or so, actually started, they, they decided let's make flood insurance that federally federally subsidized flood insurance cost what it should <laughs> so that people will have be less apt to build in these zones. It was unbelievable. Uh, bipartisan support got signed by the president, and then everyone started freaking out. Didn't last very long. Democrats <laughs> and Republican <laughs> homeowners or business owners said, wait, 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 our, our, our insurance rates are going up. Yeah. And then it got rolled back. And so, boy, that says this is bigger than just politics. So even when the politics was there, That's politics right. then mm -hmm. killed it. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to go to uh, the audience for um, some questions. Um, Mike Penders with Environmental Security International. Just uh, there are some policy challenges that have come to light in the wake of Sandy and the mm -hmm. recovery efforts, where states that had actually moved forward with resilient infrastructure may have been punished with the allocation of funds. And I think there's an opportunity in policy and recovery efforts to identify standards for resiliency um, and best practices in terms of building or recovering critical infrastructure assets. And I guess my question is, how do we advance that uh, within the uh, aid and recovery efforts? Um, uh, and, and also similar issue in Asia, when they're building dams, I represent the people of Gilgad, Baltistan, who control the water that goes into Pakistan. And there's an unholy alliance between the Chinese and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Right. to uh, uh, develop that region with what my clients consider unlawful building of dams and destroying civilizations. Uh, how do we internationally kind of impose standards that take into account the need for resiliency mm -hmm. and, and future change? Uh, I think that's yeah. Go for it. Well, this is a topic I worked on when I was at the White House uh, on President Obama's climate team. <laughs> Uh, and one of the first things that you may not know is there is no federal uh, building st uh, code. So all the municipalities, locations build to their own codes. Uh, after Sandy, it was clear that we shouldn't just have folks build back to the same level, that we need to elevate structures. Uh, and so Sandy said one foot elevation, and then uh, we now have a federal flood risk management standard that says if, if you receive federal money to rebuild or substantially uh, rehabilitate, you need to elevate your, uh, so we've done some minor things. Yeah. FEMA has also uh, proposed a reg ha to have a disaster <laughs> deductible, which would encourage states to move uh, their efforts to pre-event uh, mitigation versus just waiting for full recovery. Right now, there is a perverse incentive in the way we have set up our system that if you do less as a state, you get more money at the other end, which mm -hmm. is just not, doesn't make sense. So FEMA has proposed a regulation to improve that. Uh, but there is no question that there is a great deal more work that needs to be done. And we have been working with the building code uh, organizations who establish the national model code to ask them to incorporate climate resilience. But our codes currently today do not accurately reflect yeah. climate risk yet. Mm -hmm. So every building almost that we're building will not have climate risk taken into account unless they have uh, someone uh, for example, GSA, we uh, uh, will go out if, unless there's close attention paid to it. By the way, this is not just coastal zones. Um, wildfire risk yes. is, right. comple is so subsidized in so many ways. We're building, people build in harm's way and get bailed out routinely. And when was the last time you heard a governor say, we should build less in places that are vulnerable to fire, <laughs> yeah, with or without climate change? Uh, Headwaters Economics, which is a free market, economic analysis unit in, in the West um, has done really important work on this. And again, it's not a climate change issue. Mm -hmm. It's a why are we building in stupid places issue. Right. Um, but exacerbated by climate change. No in question some places, that the yeah. wildfires yeah. are burning hotter, longer. Wildfire season has increased uh, uh, by several months. Uh, and in California, the firefighters will tell you it's no longer a season. So actually, mm -hmm. the right. climate change is having a substantial impact on what's burning. Mm -hmm. um, I think they have it back there. Uh, yeah, hi. Christopher Flavel from Bloomberg News. Uh, thank you for the panel. It's great. Can you chat about um, the current state in the Navy? Uh, to what degree do you find the administration is 
aware of the challenges facing the Navy? Are they addressing it? Do you have some indication yet of whether their staffing or their statements suggest they plan to continue acting on this? Yeah. I guess, is that mine? <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm no longer in the Navy. Uh, Next. <laughs> but no, but I, I think um, um, my sense is the Navy is very much aware of, of this. Um, if you go back, I think it was in June, mm -hmm. they came out with the uh, plan as it applied to the Arctic. Um, I think what that really represented was, was more or less an accounting of where a lot of the investments are currently going. And as I read that, it didn't really um, address proactively some of the challenges that we're going to face. Because I think, you know, we talked about some of the coastal infrastructure, but when you, when you get ready to move up into the Arctic and operate um, uh, routinely up there, the, the infrastructure investments uh, need to be made uh, for facilities from which you can stage response operations. I mean, right now, if there was a cruise ship that got in difficulty up in the Arctic, um, it would be a challenge uh, to mount a significant uh, operation up there. Additionally, we're not talking about the investments in, in sensing and communication. Most of our systems are optimized uh, up to about, what, 75, 80 degrees. And, and if you're in the Arctic, you're up higher and, and things behave differently. What are the investments that we need to make there? Those are the types of things that I think we really need to be thinking about. I think people are thinking about it, but then when you start to stack up the, the costs of all of the other things that are going on, it's, it's really quite a challenge. Uh, for people to do that. Uh, so short answer, awareness, yes. Uh, the realities of budgets uh, kick in and you have to have to make choices. Uh, I just want to actually amplify the question for the two others here. Yeah. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of reporting on this question of this administration's emerging policy and, and structure and the national security community. There, mm -hmm. I've, there's signals that there's a preemptive, I don't know if it's fear-based or whatever, in, th this might be part of your question, but I, there is a question about how much of this kind of information will even reach the White House now. Well, that has anything related to the C word. I, th I think the, the great benefit, you know, to go back to your specific question about the Navy, uh, that the Navy and the services have, is it's about, it's about getting the mission done. It's not a political uh, driver. It's not an uh, emotional issue. It's what does, what does a regional commander, what does a commander, what does the Navy need? to accomplish the mission and be ready to accomplish missions across the broad portfolio that we do. And an example a little bit closer, you know, closer to home, again, I'll go back to the Virginia uh, vacapes, you know, mid-Atlantic area, is there have been some resiliency efforts already, already applied uh, to, those, to those bases there. The challenge is, and again, to go back to what was alluded to and what's alluded to in, in the question, is how do you approach the White House and how do you approach the Hill and put it in a language that doesn't elicit a recoil response. So again, I, I go back to the, you know, couching and framing the discussion or the asks, you know, from the service chiefs around those two, around those two issues. Is how is it, how is it going to enhance and reinforce security, and how is it going to uh, avoid additional costs going forward? So making the argument based, you know, anchored on those two items. You know, what are the security items and what are the economic items going forward? I, I would just add, uh, from my perspective, uh, I think that uh, the federal government has uh, some remarkably dedicated, passionate people uh, in the workforce, and some of them, by the way, are here tonight, I'm delighted to see them, uh, who are committed to making sure that their nation remains safe. So uh, I think that some of this work will continue. Yeah. Gary raised one point that I, is of grave concern, and that's the science. The federal government is an important source of funding uh, and drives the science agenda for in many places. And for us to stop monitoring, stop developing the science, really increases the vulnerability uh, to the planet because it's the developed nations, including the United States, that really provide the science for the rest of the world. 
Uh, so that is a very grave concern. But I am confident that there are uh, dedicated public servants who will continue to watch and do what they can, even if they're not receiving a direct order to work on climate change. And even if they don't say in bright lights, I'm working on climate change, mm -hmm. the risks are simply too great for this to be ignored. And uh, at some point, the political climate will change, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and uh, this work will prove to be enormously valuable for anyone going forward. And for those who um, get grumpy, I have a signal on my phone, and I'm happy to hear from you. <laughs> Did you I was just going to add one thing. The, we had a companion piece to Task Force Climate Change, and that was Task Force Energy. Yeah, and right. it gets to what, um, uh, what Deke was saying. And, and that was the one where there was a, the, the initial blowback was, you know, you're turning the Navy green. Um, and, and, and a major motivation for Task Force Energy in, in the peak of the bad days in Iraq, we were losing a, a, a soldier or a sailor on every fuel convoy. And the response that I had was, if I have to drive half as many fuel convoys, right. I save people's lives. So if you want to argue about why we're pressing on this, mm -hmm. it comes down to mission effectiveness. Yeah. And, and when you move energy, you put people at risk. And so the less energy you use, the less people you put at risk. And I think being able to have that security discussion in real terms as, a, as it applies to the young people who we ask to go in harm's way, I think is a very powerful discussion to have. And once you frame it in that, you tend to win a lot of the arguments. Yeah. And by the way, the cultural, the folks who study the psychology of this issue, and I've written more than one piece that has the title, um, Climate Disputes Hide Energy Agreement. And it's true. You, go, you can go to Oklahoma, as a video journalist for CNN did, the heart of oil country. And he interviewed people about global warming. And they're all, you know, Al Gore, Al Gore, Al Gore. Uh, but when the discussion turned to uh, clean energy or energy that makes sense or energy that lets you not have to pay a check to a utility, they're, they're this oil guy has uh, his house covered with solar panels. and. It has nothing to do with climate change. It's because he wants to get off the grid. So there, there's so many cultural opportunities there to cross right. boundaries as well. Um, so I hear an acknowledgment um, on the panel that uh, there is an acceptance of the resilience issue among some populations more so than the mitigation issue, right? We have people who want to respond to the effects of climate change and, so, and people who don't want to... Um, work on mitigation because they don't believe it exists or because they believe it is not man-made and therefore mm -hmm. outside of our control. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is, is it possible to achieve a sufficient level of national security based on resilience work alone or do we need the mitigation piece? Um, I, I, this, this question is sort of like without having to answer the question of like, is climate change man-made or, mm -hmm. um, you know, which issue is more important? But can we have success if there is a significant population that's only willing to work on the resilience piece and not willing to work on the mitigation piece? And I think you've already spoken to this a little bit in your discussion of, like, maybe by changing the conversation, mm -hmm. you can get to doing some of the work that, that would speak to mitigation but isn't the narrative of mitigation. Mm -hmm. Such a great question. Yeah, I, th I think that's the what and the why. And I think the, uh, the Department of Defense <laughs> is very good at approaching the what. Uh, that being said, I think this issue requires a whole of government approach. So the why, I think, can be better addressed by, by, other, by other portions of the government, as well as the policy measure formation going forward. I think the other advantage that the DOD offers is it's, a, it's an organization that can help that other aspect by providing the opportunity to wrap the risk of development of technology, be able to wrap the risk of, of capital. You know, these are things that require patient money and they require a, a patient and substantive and deliberate and disciplined approach. And as we've seen, I think in the past couple of years, I mean, really probably now for the past 15 years, we've seen a very good directed effort towards the what towards a what would be considered to be resilient because it directly 
impacts the critical infrastructure of the DOD, not only here in the United States, but worldwide, to affect the mission. And I think there's a lot of lessons learned that can be pulled out of that and applied to other areas. That said, I think it's going to be going forward, as Gary mentioned, you know, there needs to be that continued investment in science and a basic R&D uh, in this area. And again, likewise, I think we're going to see, again, funded by government, wrapping the risk uh, going forward, you know, giving people the latitude and the and degrees of freedom they need to really drill and continue to drill in this issue uh, to have benefits for, you know, not only for our country, but our friends and allies worldwide and really for everybody. The, yeah. Well, I think when you, you can work on resilience without really addressing climate change, um, but eventually you have to ask, what am I being resilient to? Uh, and this was highlighted to me at a, a forum that was held at Norfolk, looking at their great sea level rise risks, mm -hmm. uh, and they're also suffering from subsidence, 30 military installations need to plan with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and Senator Tim Kaine had arranged a uh, panel. I was on the panel. And someone very naturally asked, well, what level of sea level rise should we plan for? Dead silence in the room. Mm -hmm. But that's the key question for them facing sea level rise. So eventually, I think with resilience, we get back to climate change, which then how, uh, how much do we build for is how much have we mitigated? Uh, the great plus thing plus I the see, uncertainty, right? Right, which is but real. If you work in resilience on climate change, I think most people eventually conclude the risks are so great that we need to mitigate. Uh, so that that's eventually where the conversation. But right now, as a nation, it's probably a, a, a wonderful achievement that we get focus on just thinking about resilience, mm -hmm. given where we are on Good the movement. mitigation side. The other thing, I, and this may uh, be off-putting to some people in the audience, but I really do think that as part of this focus on, on the science and how do we, how do we come at um, some of these challenges, we have to rationalize how we're organized in that regard. Um, and, and how do we uh, optimize, truly optimize, the role of, of universities our national lab system. Um, I think that has gotten a bit out of control and we really need to think about how do we come at this effectively? How do we uh, drive quickly to getting the, the, the science that we need at, at, a, at a cost and that we don't have, you know, that we're not planting a thousand flowers. We don't have that option. Um, I was reading a, a memo that someone gave me um, a couple of weeks ago, and it, and it was uh, right before World War II, and uh, the storm clouds were gathering, and the scientific community uh, came together, and, and they were trying to decide, how do we organize to really address these pressing challenges that we're going to have? And the last line of the memo said, um, we must move out on this, we don't have a moment to lose, and the memo was dated December 6th, 1941. Um, I'm not saying that that's where we are, but we really need to have some sound national thinking about what is the, the infrastructure that we need and, and not have everybody feeding at the trough. And th th I got to add one thing about this, having studied the science for 30 years. The, one of the least convenient realities in global warming science is this thing called commitment. The IPCC reports have described this for many years, that the climate system has momentum. And even if we had a perfect climate mitigation policy on emissions tomorrow, the climate system won't notice that for about two generations in a meaningful way, meaning sea level raise, rise, uh, patterns of climate change are, are pretty much locked in. You're looking at the climate change built that's already built. Mm -hmm. And that's why resilience, decoupling the resilience mm -hmm argument from the mitigation reality, which is on a very long time scale, as the Paris Agreement has finally framed, is essential. Because other, you, can't, you can't solve it, unless you do some massive geoengineering geo solution, which no one seems to be uh, wanting to talk about yet. Hmm. So it's, anyway. So Admiral Roth, that's sort of going back to the comments you made about the focus on operational energy, the value streams, <clears throat> trying to use you to try to get a window on key players in the administration, by the way, Adam Siegel, Insight Through Analysis. Um, I've seen General McMaster's, and I've talked to him, 
about operational energy. He's made some wonderful mm -hmm. comments about troops on the field. Not surprising from a general who served in Iraq. Uh, the same thing from General Mattis has made comments about the battlefield. Do you have any window on their perspectives on the climate science, on the larger issue of climate, rather than the focused ground troop perspective of um, uh, I want to avoid putting my soldiers or Marines at risk in the battlefield. Yeah, and no, I really do not. Um, but um, but I think that in in the effort to drive to some of those solutions, um, y you are getting to the to some of the things that, that we have to address. You know, the, the U.S. military is a is a huge user of energy. There's no question about it. Um, but, uh, and Deke, you may have, you know, more accurate information, but if you look at what our, the percentage of, of U.S. usage is, I think it's what? It's, a lar it's the largest. It's the largest consumer. Largest user, but it, it comes out to be around 4%. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, um, you know, but I think it's, it's important. Um, the, the way the U.S. military really changed their thinking on, on operational energy um, I think can be a model for others to use. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we had a great motivator of uh, people's lives and mission effectiveness. But I think that we have to have some of those discussions um, in, in other sectors and, and how do you motivate people to think differently uh, about what it is that we're about. And I think, you know, further, I think you're going to see the mission set drive the solution set going forward. That's kind of the impetus, you know, starting on the operational energy analysis and evaluation, and then applications. And I think you're going to see that continuing to go forward because the technology has advanced, the war fighting has changed, and we're going to continue to see both those things uh, being dynamics going, going forward, to be sure. And Cosmo, I'm here representing myself. Um, <laughs> on the floor. Let's talk about science a little bit more, and I want to ask you each to go into imagine if we had to outsource our science or if it had to be offshored <laughs> what does that mean not only for security but for global competitiveness hmm. uh, I, I think that's a that's a terrific question and it's huge and my concern is that particularly in um, um, in, in what I would call uh, clean energy that you know you can you, you can listen to one camp that says we don't want to talk about clean energy but the fact of the matter is the the world is going to need it and my position being somewhat uh, you know self-centered here is the United States should be the leader in that technology mm -hmm. We should drive that technology. We should own that technology. Uh, we should inspire our scientists and engineers to, to pursue that and become the global leader in clean energy. That's where I think we have to go. And, and unfortunately, um, that argument doesn't seem to be getting a lot of traction because it tends to get put in the bin of that's about clean energy and we don't want to go there. We've already outsourced our nuclear R&D capacity. Yeah. China, you know, Bill Gates and a few people are doing it, but most of it moved out of this country a long time ago when the, it was, that's why the, the Navy created our nuclear industry mm -hmm. and no one ever updated it. Mm -hmm. So, any other thoughts? Uh, well, I, I have a concern because uh, from where I sit, when you talk about resilience, one of the great gaps is that local communities don't have the proper information as to what they need to do. They need uh, greater understanding. Uh, so, if you outsource that, I just don't, it would be extremely difficult for those communities to be adequately prepared. It isn't one size fits all in this. Uh, it's very specific to locations and we actually, mm -hmm. that's a gap we need to close in our science so that we can help communities make wise land use decisions, decisions about what kind of buildings they're going to build, uh, everything about how to build a safe community. It doesn't exist in any fulsome way yet. Uh, and that would be a terrible result for us. And, and I'd further add, we can't afford to outsource our science. And this goes, this directly ties into uh, the requirement to take a whole of government approach. I mean, we, as the United States, 
You need to demonstrate leadership, continue to demonstrate leadership in, in basics in science and basic R&D. We need to demonstrate you know, leadership as far as applying that, that science and R&D to these hard, complex, ambiguous problems going forward. And I don't think we can be either perceived, real or otherwise, as kind of trying to, to shove this off somewhere else and let someone else come up with a solution. We need to do that in the United States. Yes, We're private stock. I'm with the Sierra Club, and I'm a scientist. Yeah. And uh, look, this has been very encouraging and concerning. I, mean, <laughs> I think everything's kind of joined together. Uh, I want to make a couple of comments about science. One is, what can be done about what seems to be uh, very prevalent right now, maybe has always been prevalent, when there's competition between beliefs or emotions or whatever and evidence, beliefs, emotions seem to dominate. And I, I feel like we're really in that predicament big time right now. Incidentally, one, uh, I don't know if you ever say it in your articles, but one of the things that shows up quite a bit is uh, uh, the, uh, the science is, uh, is completed, it's finished, it's settled, whatever. Well. Everybody here knows science is never really settled. We keep right. getting new information, mm -hmm. which is very mm -hmm. important. So, you know, and, and that gets pushed back. Uh, I remember the uh, tobacco industry playbook, which we are seeing uh, in spades now yeah. in, this, in this area. So anyway, I, I don't know what can be done about the beliefs, emotions, et cetera. They're, they're important, obviously. We need to pay attention to them. But what about the weight of evidence? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can do a lot of science. Yeah. But if the weight of evidence is always going to be kind of sublimated, we have a problem. How much do you miss the Office of Technology Assessment? Yeah. It's still there, but it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, what I'll say you know, to your, to your uh, uh, question, sir, is you can start on Constitution Avenue right down the street here. As you start heading towards the hill, it starts being, as you, as you leave the point of departure with your facts and your science, and you get closer to the hill, it starts to become more of a religious discussion rather than one based on facts and science. And that is, and that is the, and when I say religion, you can apply that to a number of different things, whether it's the politics or the, 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 you know, the mindset. And that's why, again, it's, it's the approach, it's the message. How do you want to frame the important discussions that, that need to be had? And I think there's been a weariness uh, both, both on the hill, and again, you can, you can cut me off on the knees on this, and, and in the White House, about trying or attempting to take a pure environmental approach to these challenges. Because for one, it's a much broader, it's a much broader issue, and the implications are, are significant. So I think having a, having a, framing the discussion in a more foundational way, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, around security, around economics, around how it directly impacts the vital interests of the United States, and then further to our friends and allies, is a way to get traction on these issues. So we can take your science and get further down Constitution Avenue before it starts coming a discussion about religion. This is a good time for everyone to wrap it up. So, um, Well, I just would make one uh, point. <coughs> Ironically, science could help us understand why humans have such difficulty science. dealing with climate change. <laughs> with science. Uh, the behavioral uh, science. The behavioral is scientists yeah. have taught us a lot about Absolutely. our heuristics, the biases that we all have in, fil in uh, filtering information, which seem to be at play when you talk about climate change. Absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things, and in, in, in similar to the effects that you were talking about and how long they set in, um, I really do believe there has to be a reinvigoration of, of at the earliest stages of our educational system to really expose uh, our young people uh, to science, uh, to, um, to the disciplines that go into your work, uh, so that as that generation and subsequent generations rise, they have a better appreciation for it. And I, I will, you know, from uh, my experience as, as an educator having been the Commandant at the Naval Academy, it was remarkable how um, the preparation for the rigorous technical program that we had there was not being properly fed by the primary and secondary education system. And I think that that is fundamental to a society 
uh, to a culture that needs to understand really hard stuff and be able to question it in ways uh, that, uh, that employ a scientific method of problem solving. Uh, we've got to get back to that rigor. Uh, so, you know, that's another windmill to tilt at, but I thought I'd throw that yeah. out there. Well, it's been a great discussion uh, to set up for those who want to watch the film because we've gone from this sort of technical issue of national security and climate change to the realm of values and beliefs. And, and those, as, as Alice said, go to the, this week's New Yorker, uh, Elizabeth Colbert, has a really good article based on a couple of, focused on a couple of books on, on why information mostly doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> and and it, it's, uh, you know, as a journalist, it took me 20, 20 years of writing about climate change before I started writing about the, the climate in here and, and why people are so fundamentally different about this issue. And, and it's kind of liberating, it's liberating when you, it's hard, it's like a cold shower, that, that research, but it's essential if you want to make progress in a diverse planet. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Thank you all for uh, contributing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.